mean, usually, uh, you know, set theory tells us that, uh, I mean, if you have statements just with just one or two alternations of functional quantifiers, and you have a theorem that you can prove using Zorn's lemma, if it is sufficiently low level of complexity like this, then you can actually automatically prove it without. And it looked like, to me, I was wondering if the statement you had there fell within this ambit. Well, I mean, it's certainly it's a statement. Simple. It's a statement uh, just on the basis that it postulates the existence of a unique object. It's a statement that you would be very surprised to. You'd be very surprised if you needed the Zorn's lemma. On exactly. the other hand, uh, somehow, you know, the, the idea that, okay, there is some proof that doesn't use it, but I don't, I can't write down that proof is not, I mean, well, so it's I'm not saying very It I could be the case that sort of, you know, you, you, can, you can indeed, uh, that, that could be the case. No, I'm just I saying there is, okay, so what I, I'll rephrase what I said. There, there is a set theoretical theorem that gives you a simple two-liner that will say if you can prove this using Zorn's lemma, you can prove it without. Yes, yeah, no, no, certainly, that could be the That's case. But, I but I, I, what I am interested in is <laughs> the proof without, not the statement that it can be proved. <laughs> I am not that far in sort of recursion theory, so I, I have to stay with. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So suppose we took um, George Ellis's proposal this morning very seriously. Yes. And we say, OK, infinity is not just a large number, and we're going to impose that there is an absolute maximal curvature. What would this do to cosmic censorship? What would this do to your informing observers? Well, I mean, somehow, it's not that, in principle, one could not hope that everything can be, that everything can be formulated in that world. The, the biggest problem, however, in trying to formulate things, let's say, replacing uh, asymptotic flatness with the assumption that there is a boundary at some you know, finite uh, quote radius, is that um, uh, then, then you have to try to rationally discuss the, an initial boundary value problem for, for the Einstein equations. Mm -hmm. And moreover, you, you, you have to find some way of uh, interpreting boundary data, because you're going to be putting in boundary data, so you have to. And actually, both of these problems are completely open and very difficult, in fact. Uh, that's to say, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the Einstein equations have proven very, uh, very determined to prevent sort of a, a, a nice description of this uh, initial boundary value problem. So of course, it's, it's, it's certainly an interesting thing to, to try to do. but. Already, even just understanding that problem locally, understanding sort of what is the correct boundary data and somehow you know why solutions of that problem are well well behaved locally is very very difficult. So um, you know, given an understanding of that, then somehow okay, you can rethink everything which is done and you can sort of you know uh, rephrase everything in a very explicitly quantitative way and sort of all these conjectures you can sort of try to rephrase. Uh, in that way. I, I, I doubt that these notions could have been discovered like that. I think it would have been very difficult to understand the, the black hole notion had one originally been forced to look like that, but a posteriori, certainly you can, you can do that. And you know, there are, there are, moreover, that picture, you know, there are, there are certainly, uh, you know, in view of the importance of, let's say, numerical relativity, where you know that that picture may actually sort of be more connected to what you actually do, it certainly would be great to also have a, a, a conceptual understanding of that picture. I mean, so that's yeah, that's my answer to that. One of the things one one sometimes gets told about GR is that we ought to expect the the singularities to be places where the theory breaks down because we have arbitrary high curvature, a classical theory of gravity shouldn't be able to handle that, etc. I'm just trying to get a grip on that second form of censorship. Can we read that as saying that the only places the theory breaks down are those kind of places, that there aren't any breakdowns in places where the theory ought to be perfectly well behaved? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can, uh, certainly. I mean, it says more, it says, if you want more than that, it says that, <laughs> that, it says that ma macroscopic observers cannot survive as macroscopic observers at the point where the theory breaks down and you sort of, 
you know, want to start entertaining other theories. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is the... So, so this statement apply for the very early stage of the universe, for instance? Or? Well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll return to my caveat, which is the following, that somehow <laughs> and the, uh, the caveat is here. Uh, of course, you know, you can say that, you know, there is a Cauchy, there is a hypersurface in, in, in the universe, which I want to think of as a Cauchy hypersurface. I want to look at the maximal Cauchy evolution of whatever equations backwards. And I, I want to entertain the stability problems, the, the stability properties of what I see. And so in particular, you, you know, you can, you can ask sort of what do, you know, what does the generic past evolution look like? And, you know, in that context, you know, you could, you could apply, you could try to apply all these notions, in, you know, to the study of uh, sort of the, the, the cosmological past. But th there is a sense in which this is not natural simply because somehow the, 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 the question of asking uh, stability of the cosmological past to perturbation of initial data is not such a natural question. I mean, if for whatever reason you think it's natural, then you can certainly <laughs> pose these questions and all these considerations apply. And you can conjecture this, for instance, uh, this type of uh, statement about the cosmological past. Um, but uh, somehow it's not clear that, it's not clear that one should be asking for stability. I mean, uh, certainly, Naively, at least, uh, one would not think that that's such a natural notion to ask for in the past. So that, I mean, there is nothing, it, it is not a question of asymptotic flatness versus something else. I mean, all, I mean, the strong cosmic censorship conjecture, you can, um, I mean, you can formulate this conjecture sort of, certainly in the cosmological setting. I mean, you could say it makes sense to formulate towards the future, certainly. But, uh, <laughs> It's just that the, the, the nature of these problems makes them somewhat unnatural when you... Stability when you for the future, them. not for the past. Yes, yes, yes. You don't yes. need stability in the past. Yes. Um, how much do you think the theory itself can tell us about uh, why it breaks down? So, for instance, in the Swashul case, you said it's a good property, right, that there are these... That you get infinite curvature and infinite tidal forces before you hit the singularity, because it sort of explains why singularity is there and the, you, why you can't extend the curve. Uh, but then when you go to the, the, the next case about Cauchy horizons, yeah. is there a statement of this form? And, and also, what do you think we should say about um, Cauchy horizons from closed uh, time-like curves? Well, so first of all, uh, yeah. I, I've <laughs> so let me begin with the, begin with the latter, that somehow I've formulated all these questions about questions concerning the maximal Cauchy development of initial data. So somehow, uh, you know, this way, and th this, this is simply because it is only in the setting, the setting of dynamics, that I trust notions of genericity, etc. Okay, because I know in some sense what generic initial data means. Um, so, Questions when these types of issues are entertained, when you know you're you're, you're trying to ask, you're trying to pose genericity properties on the space-time a priori, as opposed to on initial data, because your space-time is not uh, an evolution of initial data. For instance, in the case where it uh, contains closed time-like curves, then these you know, these problems become much um, less well defined. So you know I. Uh, <laughs> I don't have so much intuition for them, and they are not as robust, uh, their behaviors so, as problems. Um, so uh, that as far as the, the, the sort of close time-like curves. Um, well, I mean, as far as the sort of why you have incompleteness, I think it's, it's very, very clear already just from the curve solution. You don't have to know anything more. That the Penrose's incompleteness theorem, in, in some sense, again, morally, it is capturing the curve phenomena. So it, it is really the case that the, just by the very nature, the fact that it is a contradiction argument, it is a genuine contradiction argument, it is simply saying that you know, 
somehow there, there is a tension between global hyperbolicity and uh, somehow the null geodesics uh, being of infinite length uh, if you have a trapped surface. I mean, it's, it's, it really has nothing to do with the blow up of anything. And it's really not, it's really not saying anything like that. And it's not that it's secretly saying it, but it's hard, it's, it has nothing to do with that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in this sense, uh, maybe what I said was slightly, uh, I mean, the way I said uh, regarding Schwarzschild that uh, the Schwarzschild, um, this behavior, the fact that observers are torn apart, it tells you why incompleteness happened, uh, was actually slightly dishonest. That um, it does not tell you why incompleteness happened. Incompleteness happened to happen, and it's very fortunate that this happened, let's say, before uh, you had Cauchy horizons. It's, it's actually a fortuitous accident that this happened. And in fact, uh, in fact this, uh, this, as we'll see next time, is the situation that somehow uh, this Schwarzschild behavior does not happen um, in general. This is not what, what one expects. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll talk about this uh, tomorrow. I was just to ask if we move from vacuum to add a cosmological constant, so we haven't got an asymptotically yes. flat, but the sitter, what if anything changes? Well, I mean, for instance, I mean, this notion of, it, it's interesting to look at these questions, I mean, in the context of, let's say, uh, Schwarzschild de Sitter, Kurt de Sitter, um, where you, you can again formulate, let's say, strong cosmic censorship, thinking about the future, let's say, thinking about the, the boundary of the maximal development in these black hole regions. Uh, and uh, yeah, it turns out that there is, uh, as, as uh, I maybe we'll <laughs> say next time, th there is a difference. And uh, whereas uh, you can still conjecture, you can still conjecture this, uh, and you should still conjecture this, the precise formulation of what you can conjecture may have to change. Um, which, which, which is interesting. I mean, it's uh, one of the lessons from that is that there's no a priori reason why these conjectures should be true finally. It's really, you know, if they end up to be true, it's really something special and somehow, you know, very with um, easy modifications of the equations in question, you could, you know, construct worlds of equations when these equations are not, these conjectures are not true. So it's really something, if, if true, finally, it's really something special. Okay, let us thank our speaker again then.